Okay, do you want to just you know, pick it up from when you heard the Sex Pistols? Okay, um, yeah, just seeing the um, Sex Pistols on television was you know, like a religious experience. And um, I immediately got on my push bike and went to Kesha's house and said, Kesh, we're forming a band and it's going to be like the Sex Pistols. And uh, sort of pretty much grew from that. You know, we just started mucking around in, in our bedrooms and, you know, met Ray at school who, um, you know, we discovered also like punk rock because I think we were the only three guys at school that liked punk rock at the yeah. time. Everyone else was pretty much, you know, into ACDC and Led Zeppelin. Actually, yeah. I met the other two guys in um, high school and everybody was kind of into hard rock and heavy metal that was around Kiss and because I think Black used to lend me his Led Zeppelin tapes or whatever and I used to record Kiss for him and stuff like that. We used to this is bef all before punk, and then punk came along, and then everything else just. Um, we just forgot about everything else yeah. once punk came along. It was sort of like, I don't know, like, you know, we all really enjoy bands like ACDC and Led Zeppelin and stuff, but I remember personally always thinking, man, it's got to be something more, you know, this isn't extreme enough. And then, you know, when I saw the pistols on television, it was like, this is what I've been waiting for. So, so and that was it from then on, because that was. <coughs> the ambition everything else sort of fell out of the picture so when you started the hard-ons with did you have it in mind to be a, a thrashy fast guitar punk band uh pretty much yeah we've, definitely yeah we've um kind of like really influenced by the records that that were coming out like the the punk ben benchmark albums like the saints first album um buzzcocks first album Ramon's first album, stuff like that, the Dan first album, they all got like extreme guitar sounds on it and that's what we wanted to do. Yeah, we became like avid record collectors and it was like, you know, once we saw, you know, we knew about this punk rock stuff, we just went apeshit, you know, we used to know where all the shops were in town and we'd go in there and say, okay, what's, what's another punk record that I haven't heard, yeah, you know, here's to, the yeah. money. We used to like save all our pocket money and and have like um, excursions into the city after school and on weekends and Thursday nights and stuff like that, going to um, the shops that were in, in the city. Like our favorite place was probably Record Plant because I used to have um, um, boxes and boxes of rare singles. And Frank Cotterell used to pull out the boxes and let us um, go through them. And you know, you, we picked up the Victims first single and you know, Thor Criminal singles and stuff like that. Yeah, even back then the Australian stuff really really impressed us because it seemed to be a lot more savage than the stuff from overseas. You know, like the Damned and the Ramones were like, you know, <coughs> awesome bands, but their sound on record was, you know, very produced and clean, whereas, you know, the Saints was just so in your face. And, you know, X was like, you know, legend has it that it was recorded in nine hours, which was just like amazing. And I thought it was five. <laughs> That's okay, what it says on the back of the record, five hours. Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> so, as far as, you know, when you you did start to make it, or, you, you know, you actually made it without that media and you're, you're touring around going overseas, you got any good, good anecdotes or stories of touring around and times on the road? Sure, there's plenty. Yeah. Like, was it the, you know, the sex and drugs tours of the that rock and roll mythology tells us that it is? No, that, that, that's the thing. None of us took drugs and none of us drank for the most part. Yeah, we're yeah. only interested in the sex, basically. And was there plus, much of that? Plus, we take our live um, performances very seriously and you find out very quickly when you do heavy tours like that where you pay six nights a week that if you get yourself trashed, you know, even like twice a week, then like, you know, half your, half your shows will suffer. And you know, we just didn't like the feeling coming off stage, saying, "Man, we we suck tonight." You know, like every time we went on stage, we just wanted to kill the world. So, you know, we never got into that side of stuff. You know, a bit of pot here and there. You know, it doesn't hurt, but nah. What about the? Did you have girls throwing themselves at you around the world? It's it's the Australian accent works wonders here and there. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually, yeah, it's a novelty, you know, like three coloured boys gave it to Europe. Yeah, the white chicks love it. Yeah, it was great. Mm. I think he wants a funny story. No, um... I'd love to tell him a story about Kirsch. Oh, 
What about the band? Um, but yeah, um, we toured with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and um, these girls thought that um, we came from the Melbourne Tennis Centre, came straight out of the dressing room, ran into, ran the, van, into the van, shut the door, and all these girls thought um, we were the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So yeah, we drove. Man. So we drove as slowly as you could, you know, possibly do. Well. Like, you know, every time the girls caught up, we'd, we'd go a little bit further. Like we kept these girls running for a pretty good mile, I reckon. It was a long time. It was a driveway up at And by then there was only two time. left because the other, other girls had stitches and just conked out. And then we thought, ah, oh, look, they're gonna die, so let's stop. So we stopped the van and these two girls rocked up. You know, like sweat pouring down, I'm totally wet, unfit. The one red, that unfit. kept right to the end was the biggest one. Yeah, and she's like, <gasps> fuck, oh, fuck, fuck. And she'd go to her friend, <laughs> man, that was unreal. One of them threw a rock at our van. Did she? Yeah, picked up a real big <laughs> rock and threw it at our van. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we know we don't have like stories that would blow you away like Sherbet did, but... Hang on, but did Sherbert play in a venue that got uh, sieged by Nazis? Oh yeah, we had a Nazi riot in Ravensburg in, um, yeah, in Bavaria. Yeah, huge, man. That was hilarious. The, the venue got sieged, we had to get barricaded inside. People that got stuck outside were like beaten within an inch of their lives. Cops came, everything was... I remember like the, the thing that set it off was um, the tour posters we had, had the three of us dressed, dressed like Ku Klux Klan and we all had boners, so you can see the boners sticking out from underneath the white robes. And if you look, you can see it like underneath the white robes, you had a guy with slanty eyes, another guy was dark, and um, well, this guy, this guy was white, but he had a huge boner sticking out from underneath. Oh, the, I had the nose. I was yeah, I had the. He was supposed to be the Jew. Anyway, also Why like. Why Nazis take offence to that? And we had this. Actually, the Australian versions had the swastikas behind us, right? And um, they actually. What you know, they they made this swastika disappear. They censored it. They said, "Oh, this is too full on." But anyway, we played in Ravensburg in Bavaria the same day the local soccer match was on, and they had a a hooligan soccer and hooligans um, picnic after the football match. The and hooligans I, picnic. So you're talking about like skinheads, you know, neo-Nazi types. I wonder what they had for nibbles. Hmm. But they, um, they, they must have seen the poster and just freaked out because we're playing at this um, youth centre, this um, kind of like left-wing political organisation had organised this um, concert. And the concert was like rock against racism or whatever. And they, anyway, they all turned up and we had a riot. So they, had, they had these um, metal slingshots and um, they had um, metal ball bearings with I the I think the they had pretty shots. much everything except for um, pistols. I didn't hear any pistol shots. I saw bicycles. They were hurling bicycles through the window. They had, because all these kids had ridden their bicycles. They, they was throwing these bicycles through the window and rocks and everything. And and um, one skinner got his head ripped off like almost when this kid hit him with a skateboard. But um, basically, it was, yeah, it was pretty ugly. They arrested one guy. That's all I did. And I remember like um, the, the, the paddy wagon had this skinhead sitting there um, in the paddy wagon had blood coming out and our drummer Kesh went up to the window and went <laughs> It was so funny. And then he, what did he say? He said, uh, I'm gonna kill you nigga. Yeah, when I get out, of, oh, when I get out, I'll kill you or something like that. But there's another great story. We were driving through um, East Germany to get to um, Berlin and um, we were at the East German um, border guard kind of thing, the, the customs, and this is before the reunification. And they were going through our bags to um, look for like whatever. And Kesh, a drummer who's normally so relaxed and um, so unflappable, um, he just started freaking out. He wouldn't let them search his bag. Anyway, they said, no, we gotta search your backpack. So he pulled out the backpack and they got this, um, little um, jewellery case and I opened it up and the look on the um, border guard was like priceless. He was like, oops, put it back and and we found out later what he had in it was like his girlfriend's um, pubic hair. <laughs> she had it shaved and put in this like, little jewellery case for him to take over to um, Europe. I thought it was quite touching. Look, if you want a funny story, I have to tell one about Kirsch in oh, you Portland. Got time. This is a great story. Yeah, look, this was a long time ago, so it's not going to hurt anyone. 
But um, when we played at Portland, Oregon, it was a killer show. We played with our friends called Poison Idea. Um, yeah, Kesh was really interested in this blonde girl and um, she invited us back to her house and there was, um, you know, a bunch of us went, you know, like one of the roadies and stuff and a bunch of her friends went. And um, Kesh wanted her, like, pretty badly. But her friend wanted Kesh pretty badly and wasn't going to take no for an answer. So um, Kesh got lumped with her and just couldn't get out of it. And at the end of the night, everyone's, you know, all pretty much asleep. It's four in the morning, whatever. And I'm about to fall asleep on the couch. And the girl that wanted Kesh goes, don't sleep in the couch, come and sleep with me. And I went, yeah, okay. So, so anyway, I'm lying in bed probably like a couple of hours later, half asleep. And um, I hear these weird noises in the room. And I'm like a little freaked out thinking, man, what the fuck's that? And then I hear like a little bit of rustling next to my bed. And I turn around and there's Kesh on his hands and knees. And he's like just about to go like this and he sees me and he goes, Blackie. And I'm like, Kesh. And he's like, sorry man, he crawls out of the room and a girl half wakes up goes, oh, what's happening? It's, oh, nothing, nothing. I'm oh, just having trouble getting to sleep. <laughs> Tell him what you did. And in the man. morning, man, I go, Kesh, I have to know what were you going to say to her? What was going to be your line? And he's like, I was going to say to her, well, I can't, get, I can't go to sleep until I get a kiss goodnight. Yeah, Kesh had the best lines all the time. But just seeing his, um, I don't know, just seeing his face like that, it was, it was quite a shock. I remember um, we played, we did the big day out in um, New Zealand. That was the tour with uh, Soundgarden, the Ramones, um, I think the Smashing Pumpkins and a whole bunch of other bands anyway. Um, we'd already broken up this time. This is like early 94. We'd broken up, but we had all these gig commencements and we were doing them. And um, I remember that it was at a really big oval in, in Auckland and a whole bunch of kids like ran up to me like with like CDs and stuff and, and with felt pens and stuff. I thought, oh, here we go. I'm going to be signing some autographs. They handed me the CDs. I looked at the CDs. I they were Smashing Pumpkins CDs. They thought... <laughs> I thought I was a guy in the Smashing Pumpkins. You know, yeah, like all Asians look the same, right? <laughs> yeah, that guy was such a dickhead. Because yeah, of yeah. that, I went up to him and went, hey, I know you. And he's like, yeah. And I go, right from the hard ons He's like, Pfft, and walked away. Yeah. I wasn't very happy. Yeah, going through the 1980s as, as a um, you know, thrash grunge type band, was it hard getting like mainstream acceptance or, or you know making it up that next level as a band i think um yeah, to a certain degree yeah we were totally invisible to the um, mainstream totally invisible i remember like it took us we were one of the biggest selling like we had all these like number one singles on the independent chart um and we we pulled um more crowds than most other bands that were going around and we just couldn't get on the front cover of drum media. Just couldn't get on it for some reason. And TM, our manager, used to go, shit, they won't put you on. It's like, you've got the crowd record there. You've sold more records than this band and that band. Um, they just won't put you on the front cover. So they did put us on the front cover. The first time they put us on was um, back in 1990. We released an album called Yummy on the festival records um, deal that we had there. That was with a major record label. We finally got on the cover of Drum Media in 1990. The band had been playing live for six years. You know, we, we had to play live for six years, go overseas twice. We did two overseas tours to America and Europe and come back and then finally we get on the front cover of Drum Media. Um, Why was that? I don't know. I don't know. We, just, they, we were invisible to the mainstream. Radio wouldn't play us. Um, I, think, I think it was mainly because we had a lot of apathy towards that side of things. Like, to sort of um, succeed in that area, you kind of got to play some sort of game with the media. And like, we, we just weren't interested. You know, we were too busy making the music and playing and yeah. things like that. So we, we just um, we, never got into that side of things. And as a result, really got ignored. Yeah, at times we were deliberately abrasive mm. to, to bands, other, other bands that we would play with. And other times we were deliberately abrasive towards the media. We were, our manager had a huge attitude. Um, he just didn't let anybody step over him at all you know and <clears throat> i mean it used to get ridiculous you know you'd be like 
Okay, when we came back from Europe the first time, it was like a massive conquering um, tour. It was, it was, you know, awesome, you know, on an independent level. And, um, you know, pretty much out pulled any other Australian band that went there besides maybe the birthday party. And then we'd come back with all these stories like, yeah, we did this, yeah, we did that. And no one wanted to know. Hey, it, I and, remember and while we were over there, all we did was promote Australian bands. And all the other bands that followed us, you know, came back and used to go, wow, man, all these people came to the gigs mainly because, you know, the hard ons, you know, gave you guys a stamp of approval and, you know, because you're Australian and blah, blah, blah. I remember like once the record company Waterfront were talking about, well, the fact that there were three people of different races in the band. And um, I remember our first ever gig, people were calling out Channel O band because SBS was Channel O back then. It was a big novelty thing. They used to call out, call out, you know, United Nations and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I remember Waterfront guys saying, well, you know, we should be able to um, exploit it to get you into different avenues besides just musical, you know, like, for example, the Human Rights Commission might be able to do something with you guys or something like that. It took another maybe five or six years before anyone did something like that. There was, I remember there was a campaign that the Human Rights Commission did. Um, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like, it was an anti-racist thing, you know, and um, they put our photo in the brochure. Like, the, he, his, like here's a band, they're from Punchbowl, they're three different colors and they get along, isn't that great kind of thing? And they're musicians. And it was in the color brochure with um, other famous Australian, um, uh, you know, identities who were coloured and stuff like that, you know, and that took a long time for that to happen. I thought that would have been the most obvious thing, but I think it boils down to um, the fact that the band was called the Hard Ons for a start. I mean, if if the band's called the Hard Ons, like our priority is not going to be about getting there on the top 40 and making money and, yeah. you know, well, whereas the media ignored us, um, the crowd certainly didn't. Like yeah. I, th I think we had some pretty awesome, we had an awesome crowd, great fan base. Yeah, just speaking of the name, did it take you long to pick the name? No, yeah, actually. We did. used to, um, yeah, yeah we, we, we went, went through, through a couple of different, different names. names. But it, it was a natural name because, um, what we... Were we were like 15 yeah. at the time and the hard-ons just seemed something perfect to, uh, you know, offend everyone. You know, when you're a little kid, it's like, <laughs> let's call ourselves the hard ones. What we used to do, we used to like go into town and watch, um, sneak into pubs and watch bands and stuff. Come home on Saturday night and watch um, Donnie Sutherland's After Dark program, um, hoping that he'd play something decent. And normally he did, you know, you'd go on, you see like Slaughter and the Dogs and the Damned and stuff like that on it. And then turn off uh, Channel 7 and... How's it been? Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're going to you join someone. You remind me. Okay. <laughs> no, like we'd we'd watch that show after dark with Donny Sullen and and Channel Seven would be turned off and out would come the porno pornography. We'd slip in the video and we'd just sit there and watch it for the next five hours or whatever. And I think that's where the name came from. Why is it, do you think, like for a host of Australian bands, they actually get a, a much bigger acceptance overseas than they do in Australia? Well, for us, it was obvious, like, because we're called the hard-ons over here. In Europe, they, the, you know, the words aren't that vulgar. Um, in Germany, they kept on calling us hard ones. So um, I remember when the hard-ons first formed um, in high school, my father asked me what it meant and I told him it was like a computer program. I also think it's because that they recognised that Australian rock and roll was, was a, of a pretty good class, you know. I think bands in Australia really have to struggle to get anywhere. You have to really, you know, flog it out on the, on the pub scene before you, before you can do anything. And that really um, hones a band live performance you know almost to perfection and um, I don't think the overseas bands have that like we do like in you know in England for instance a lot of bands are um, you know they're sort of um, they don't really play live until you know their records come out you know they're sort of manufactured you know before they you know even go out in front of an audience 
And because that's what they're used to over there, that's what each band aspires to. But we come from a totally different background. I remember like we, we played um, a whole bunch of gigs with these English bands. There was a group of them, Mega City 4 and um, the Senseless Things and a whole bunch of English power pop punk bands that kind of, they were like fans of the hard-ons and we were playing with them and stuff. And um, live, none of them can cut it. Not live, like some we, of them were like laughable. And like, you know, I'd be in a crowd thinking, man, is anyone getting in any shit? And people'd be like, yeah, yeah. And it's like, man, wait till we come on. No, we we turn and up. And we did. Yeah, we'd, we'd come on, and people would be like, fucking hell. No, we we turn up to a gig in London wearing shorts and thongs and you know singlets and stuff, and there'd be these like English pop punk bands, yeah, pointy um, boots. Yeah, and, like know. Winkle Pickers and like. Um, designer label sand shoes and they'll be there crimping their hair in the back room <laughs> yeah we definitely got that over the band i could just imagine like when bands like saints and that went over there that just must have been incredible i'd love to see that okay well i think um right yeah yeah so any anything else that needs to get said for the history of australian rock you know, i just think for people out there not to ignore it and not to look so much for overseas for inspiration and you know and entertainment because there's there's plenty here and a lot of the times i think it's sad a lot of the good stuff gets ignored you know in this day in, day and age where like you know because the information highway and things like that the world's getting smaller and um you know i'm seeing too many bands in australia that are you know sort of aping the overseas stuff and you know, that doesn't need to happen and it shouldn't happen. If you listen to um, Australian 60s punk, um, some of the best punk bands in the world in the 60s were like Australian, like they were the wildest, like the Purple Hearts and the Missing Links and stuff like that. Um, Glenn A. Baker put out those um, Ugly Things um, compilations, volume one and two, are like the best 60s punk you can ever hear. But uh, um, I mean, they were much better than most of the American bands. And even 70s punk, I think Australian punk bands are like, right up there and even better than um, overseas bands. Maybe it's the isolation or something. Well, what's, uh, what's the Nick Cave story? Oh, now? no, it's not really a story. Um, um, I remember, like, when we were kids, we went after school to see this gig. It was, like, Scientists X, and um, it was a gig at the New South Wales Roundhouse. Oh, X, that was awesome. Birthday had, yeah, yeah, the birthday had birthday party had come back from England and the scientists were supporting them with X. The first band was I think a band called The Same and I can't remember them that much but um, all their songs sounded the same. But they, they the, 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 the bands that were on that night, Birthday Party and X and um, that sounds yeah, I was. I went to that gig too. Did you? Yeah, at the, at fantastic. The that it was, was just, so good. Yeah, it was, was two thousand people there. Yeah. Two thousand people so at the good. Roundhouse. Yeah, it was, it was like excellent. And um, I thought it was like one of the like, you know, like it was like yeah. totally, um, totally blew your birthday away. party were off their face. How was Nick Cave that night? He was just <laughs> just manic, and yeah. and the bass player, you know. Um, it was um, I can crazy. remember images more from that gig than actual sounds. I remember it being loud. I remember yeah. the bass player had this cowboy hat. Yeah. And he used, he'd make these noises with the bass string and he'd bend his back right back and lean against the amp. And he, he just didn't seem like um, a rock star. He just looked like a redneck or something, you know, like a cowboy or something like that. But I remember, um, I remember that gig was like, etched in my memory forever, but this is like, doesn't get better than this. And we did this um, big day out tour with um, Nick Cave and the Bad Seas back in um, 92 or something, 90, 92 or 93. Nick Cave and Sonic Youth and Mud Honey and, and from Australia, there was like us and you and I, and I think one other band traveling around Australia to, um, to play the big day out. And, and we were staying at this hotel this four-star hotel in Melbourne with all the other big day out bands and Nick Cave was at the foyer of the hotel and this is like the first time I've been drunk in about eight years or whatever so I was a little bit affected by alcohol and I thought Nick Cave's there I'm gonna just go and tell him that time I saw him in at the Sydney um, University oh, U New South Wales University roundhouses like um, like 
a really big part of my life and how great it was. I'm just going to go and tell him. And, and I went up, hey, Nick, hi. Um, I just, he said, I'm sorry I can't talk. And he just got into a car and just drove off. And um, he, I hadn't even finished my sentence. And I think um, there was like a cloud of dust and the car had moved. And I, I just wanted to tell you that the gig that you played, it, I think he was in Footscray by then. Yeah. I remember... Um, Not very nice. They organised a, a, a cruise, harbour cruise for the Big Day Up band. Iggy Pop was cool. Yeah, Iggy Pop was fantastic. He went up to a drummer, scared shadow of him because Kesha was like, who's this guy next to me? And Iggy <laughs> Pop was, hey, go on. I liked it, I liked it. <laughs> Then we had this harbour cruise on uh, in Sydney Harbour for the big day out crew and the bands. Um, and I remember like, I was wondering, driving to the harbour cruise thinking, is Nick Cave going to turn up? Because all the bands will be there, Sonic Wolf, Wolf will be there and um, Mud Honey will be there and Helmet will be there, but will Nick Cave be here? And because, you know, like the guy is um, an enigma and um, he came onto the boat when it was moored. He came, I think he walked up and he w we were sitting with the Mahani guys and they walked past us. He walked past us and then he kind of did a U-turn, went down the stairs and he went onto the plank and he walked out and I'm looking through the window, I'm thinking, well, he's going, he's not coming back. He went and then the boat left, he, he didn't come on the boat. Nick wasn't that sociable on the, the tours then. No, I was about to tackle him and go, look, um, I didn't finish my sentence the other night in Melbourne, but uh, yeah. And then see, he couldn't have escaped me because we were on the boat. What could he have done? Punch you in the head. <laughs>